I got into show business in the United States Air Force. I was uh, enlisted and became an athletic specialist because I played college baseball and there was no room in the gymnasium so they put me in the uh, service club and the service club put on shows and uh, one of my jobs was to buff the floors and I was sort of funny and so the uh, lady in charge of the service club said we're going to have an, uh, a show and if you'll MC it why uh, I'll get you out of buffing the floors. And I said sure. Well it became uh, a regular thing. I started doing it once or twice a week and it caught on and then the United States Air Force dance band on a bowling Air Force base in Washington DC the Airmen of Note picked me up and, and I toured with them and then when I got out of the service I went to college and in my senior year of college why I uh, auditioned at a place called the Purple Onion in San Francisco and I was on the bill with an act called Phyllis Diller and the Kingston Trio. I don't know whatever happened to all of them. And uh, I was hired and I stayed on after I graduated from college. And uh, then I toured with the Kingston Trio and uh, started working in Las Vegas. And then I did Gomer Pyle and the rest of course is uh, history. To be honest with you, I was uh, ill-prepared to do uh, television that much because most of my stuff had was in person and then in college I was a, a stage actor but the one thing I learned in college was to just be yourself and uh, let the comedy come out of the, whatever situation you're in instead of trying to put comedy into the situation and that helped me a lot when I started doing Gomer Pyle although uh, when I started doing Gomer Pyle I was hired actually to be the, the, the only sane person in the episodes if you think about it, Frank Sutton was a little bit above kooky, uh, and of course Gomer was always, you know, doing things. But he was right, by the way, incidentally. He was always right, and the sergeant was always wrong. If you really watch those episodes, but uh, the sergeant leads you to believe that it's Gomer that's fooling around. But they needed somebody to to look at these people from the viewer's point of view and say, hey, these this something wrong with these two guys and that was the Duke character that I played. But after a while they let me be you know, more myself and, uh, and do a little more comedy in the third or, fourth, third or fifth year. I was doing uh, Gomer Pyle at a place called Desilu Cahuenga Studios in Hollywood, still there, and uh, on the same uh, lot they were doing That Girl with Marlo Thomas and they needed somebody in a recurring role to play her agent Harvey Peck. So they hired me, and uh, by the way, after firing George Carlin, I don't know why they fired him, but they fired him and hired me to play Harvey Peck. And uh, it was a reoccurring role, and the producers were Bill Persky and Sam Denoff, and they had written a pilot earlier called Good Morning World, which was a, a takeoff on uh, William B. Williams, the uh, radio personality from New York, who I guess used to open his radio show by saying, Good morning, world. And uh, so except they wrote it with two people in mind and they did a pilot and it didn't, didn't go too well and then they liked my comedy and so they decided to redo the pilot and they asked me to uh, play one of the characters and I said well I'm going to go more pilot I said well this would be a starring role so I did it and uh, it was executive produced by uh, Sheldon Leonard and Carl Reiner so where could you go wrong I mean you know big hit big star and so I left Gomer Pyle that, uh, I think it was the fourth year, and that's how I got on Good Morning World. The problem with Good Morning World was, two, it was ahead of its time in the writing, and number two, we were opposite Tuesday Night at the Movies on NBC. Now, you must remember, 37 years ago, when Tuesday Night at the Movies was on, and they showed first-run motion pictures. There was no cable. That was the first time you'd see great movies like Duel in the Sun or whatever. And so it would be like everybody in America would open their TV guide on Tuesday and say, well, who should we watch tonight? Ronnie Schell or Cary Grant? Guess who won? So the ratings never were, were that high. Uh, the writing was good. I think the performances were good if you, if you watch the shows. Uh, and it's very funny. But uh, we were killed by the ratings, actually. And we had a couple of little internal problems in, in uh, producing the show, too. Um, Joby Baker, who played my uh, co-star, 
delightful actor. He, he did a lot of, I guess, Gidgets and did some Presley movies and also he was in a uh, movie called, uh, I think it was The Last Angry Man with Paul Muni, played the nephew. Brilliant, brilliant actor and also a marvelous painter. But he had a problem. Uh, I don't know whether he was having problems at home or what, but he had a problem learning lines. And that lasted through all 27 episodes. Seems that when he was in front of an audience, uh, an anxiety set in, and, and uh, so there was a lot of rewriting and, uh, and retakes during the 27 episodes of, uh, because of, of that problem with uh, Joby. The other problem, which was of sort of a minor nature, was that uh, <coughs> the co-star, another wonderful actress, Julie Parrish, who just passed away recently, a beautiful, beautiful young lady, good actress, but after she was signed, the producers told me later that she had a, a stroke uh, that she naturally an actor wouldn't tell you about unless it was really debilitating and really showed. But with that, she lost a lot of her energy. So the energy that she had on the pilot, she didn't have on the uh, on the episodes. But uh, they had signed her and they went with her, and she was a very good actress. And so that was another minor problem. Those were the two minor problems. But the major problem really was that. Uh, ratings. I'm one of these actors who, if I work with somebody who's had a history, I just hang around them all the time. I, I did a show with uh, Robert Mitchum, and he must have really got bored by me, because the whole week I just followed him around asking, what was it like at RKO? Tell me about Jane Russell. Tell me about working in Niagara with Mark, because I love the history of, of, of my business. And uh, so I, I, w I was that way with Billy DeWolf. Billy DeWolf, of course, was at Paramount for many, many years, and uh, and was on Broadway, and uh, and I he was a fascinating actor and a real professional, and uh, he he was a very funny man. He was a very funny man. I remember some of the things he'd say was, "How are you doing, Billy?" And he'd say, "Busy, busy, busy." He always wanted to be busy, and uh, he'd always tell me, "Mr. Shell, put it away, put it away," meaning. Don't spend all your money because you never know what's going to happen in the business. The other funny thing was, <clears throat> and it's very obvious when you see the episode, he wore a toupee. And he called his toupee, we never discuss it. He'd say, uh, how are you doing? Uh, the we never discuss it, Mr. Shell. And then one day on the set he said, well, I'm going to get a haircut today. I don't know whether I'll send it over or go over with it. Did I sense that Goldie Hawn was going to have a career after Good Morning World? Boy, did I. I uh, in fact, I'm one of the few actors that has proof that I predicted she would be a big star. Uh, a good friend of mine, Harry Martin, up in Sacramento, was a newscaster up there, came down to Hollywood and asked if I could do an interview for him for Sacramento a station. I said, yeah, let me bring my little co-star, Goldie Hawn. Whom did you bring us tonight, Ronnie? Harry, I'd like to introduce to you uh, a fine young actress comedian who's, I guarantee you, I'll make the statement right now, is going to be one of the big stars of tomorrow. Uh, Miss Goldie Hawn, who plays my oft-times girlfriend on Good Morning World, and take it away, you too. <laughs> here she is, stepping into the Lipton spotlight, Miss uh, Goldie Hawn. You know, people often ask me if I ever uh, had romantic leanings toward Goldie. And I was trying to think back because <clears throat> one of the reasons I got into this business was to make a little money and uh, meet pretty ladies, which I'm proud to have said I've met a lot of beautiful ones, the best, of course, being my wife. But uh, that is one of the reasons I didn't, uh, do we, can we say it politely, hit on Goldie? I think so. Yeah, because uh, I had just fallen in love with my wife-to-be, who I'm still married to, and Goldie, I know, wasn't interested in me because she was uh, going with a man she later married. This was before Kurt Russell. And, uh, but we had a delightful time. We, we used to rehearse. This is an interesting story. We used to rehearse in my apartment in Toluca Lake uh, near the studio. And she'd come over every night and we'd rehearse and rehearse. And she didn't like to rehearse too much. And me, I was just the opposite. I wanted to you know, rehearse it seven, eight times a scene. And she'd say... No, I, I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to overdo it. You know, I'll get to stale. And I said, Goldie, you've got to live and learn. You've got to watch me. You come on the set early and watch how I do. Learn. 
you'll never be anything unless you, unless you become a professional and become disciplined like I am as an actor. And two years later, she won the Academy Award for Cactus Flower, and I found out while working a toilet in Omaha. It was a wonderful, wonderful year and a half. And it was even more wonderful that after it was canceled, I could go back to Gomer Pyle <laughs> and get a raise. Not only a raise in salary, but a raise in rank to Corporal Duke Slater. But uh, when we were doing the show, we had no idea that uh, uh, how long it would last. We'd look at the ratings and say, does this mean anything? We didn't know that much about it. But toward the last, we, they, they grappled with some uh, recasting. And uh, at the last minute, uh, they decided uh, not to do it because we could never overcome that time slot and we were never moved at another time slot. We got another year and a half of reruns uh, during the summer and, and, uh, and in those days, you know, <coughs> they, don't do, they didn't do a show and uh, cancel it after three episodes. They'd do it even 12 you'd get if you were the worst show on television. Well, we did, what, 27, and uh, we're never in the top uh, 20. So it was nice to, to finish that show and go back to a number three, number two, and number one show, which Gomer Pyle always was in five years. But I had a great experience. I loved, I loved Joby, I loved uh, Julie. I still see Goldie every once in a while, and we pick up right where we left off. She's just as lovely, and, 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 and coincidentally, <coughs> the first movie I ever was in was called The Strongest Man in the World, starring Kurt Russell. So I have a, sort of a thing, both of them, when I see them. Uh, and uh, of course, I miss Billy DeWolf. He used to call me every night uh, when we got home from, from work and uh, after dinner and tell me, oh, Mr. Shell. I didn't like you sticking your tongue out. Never stick your tongue out in to try to get a laugh, Mr. Shell. I remember that because I'd go, ah, you know, something like that. He was always constructive criticism. I miss him. I miss him dearly. Yeah. My career has been very good. I uh, I've never been out of work. I've been very fortunate. Uh, I diversified early on. Started doing movies. I did seven uh, Disney movies after Gomer Pyle. And I've done, I think, 23 movies in all. Never a big star. And as I like to say, it's awfully lonely at the middle. But I like the middle because I'm what uh, some people call a survivor. And uh, I managed to uh, do a, a number of television commercials that some of them became memorable. And uh, I've, 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 I've done pretty well. I've, I've managed to, like I say, I'm doing so well I now have a home on both coasts, one in Tijuana, one in Newark. But um, it's, it's wonderful to know that uh, I have enough money to last the rest of my life, <coughs> providing I die on August 16th. <laughs> I wonder if I should mention it's been a long time coming since I did my very, very first nationwide television appearance as a college senior on You Bet Your Life with Groucho Marx. And now, uh, for those of you that ever get down into the uh, Palm Springs area, I'm doing a show every year called Senior Class, which is a marvelous, uh, I say marvelous musical because I didn't write it, but it's a fun show and, and we're in our second and third season and doing extremely well. So I invite all your, my Good Morning World fans to come down, if they're both still living.